Good morning. Scripture reading today is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, 1 through 16. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the manner of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captains, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, that means, what, what does it mean, but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended <coughs> far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the winds and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness of deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I send us the reading of God's holy word. May he bless us truths unto our hearts. And may we be in prayer. Father God, we ask thy blessing upon us today as we are gathered in your house to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Father, we know that our number is not great, but we know our Father that even though we're not, that you are here with us because we remember your words when you said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. For that, our Father, we're grateful. Father, we thank thee for the beauty of the day, the sunshine and the rain. We thank thee, our Father, for all the blessings that you've given to us, and the blessing of just waking me up this morning and making me able to come into your house and worship thee. Father, we ask your blessing upon each one here, and Father, basically we ask thy blessing upon those that would like to have been here and are not able. Be with them, our Father. Care for them. Heal those that need healing. Comfort those that need comfort. Bless those that need blessing. Father, we, we come into your house, into your presence, and with love and 
care and concern. And we know, our Father, that we love you because you first loved us. And Father, we give to you all our love, all our care, all of our concern. Father, we ask that you be with Brother Wayne. Continue to bless him and to heal him that he might be able to be home in his own house and his own family and his own church. And Father, we pray that this will happen soon. Bless him and lift him up. We pray, our Father, that for those that were meant to cheer this morning, uh, for Judy Blackwell, we pray, our Father, be with her and her concerns. Be with that family. Be with the, with the other ones that have been mentioned. And we just pray, our Father, for blessings and care and healing and, and concern. Father, we thank thee for this great nation that we live in. Help each of us do our part in turning it back to one nation under God. Be with our great military. Keep them strong and keep them safe that they will be able to protect us and keep us free. That we will be able to worship thee openly as we are today. Father, for all that you do for us day in and day out for the blessings of life for just waking me up this morning. Father, we just thank you for all of these things. We ask thee be with us now, our Father. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto thee, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Some of you probably remember the country comedian Jerry Clower, I've got a few of these books at home. One of them was called Let the Hammer Down. I don't know what the other ones are called, but I've, I've read some of these books. And, and he's a very funny storyteller. He died in 1998, which surprised me it's been that long ago. But even though he was a great storyteller and you didn't know a whole lot about him by watching him on TV or anything, he was a very deeply religious man. And he tells of one occasion when he was going to the country music boards in Hollywood and he asked his daughter Sue, who was 14 years old at the time, if she would like to go to the country awards with him and meet some of the stars of the day and the dignitaries, and he even asked her, that told her that she could take one of her friends with her. But what do you think Sue's response was? She said, Daddy, I love you, and I'm so glad that you could arrange for me and one of my friends to go on this trip. But Daddy, there's something going on at church this weekend, and I don't want to miss it. So I won't be able to go with you to Hollywood and the CMT Awards. Well, Jerry Clower said that his eyes welled up with tears. And he said he wanted to think the doxology. To think that this church activity was more important to his daughter than a trip to Hollywood and to meet a lot of big celebrities and dignitaries. Think about that. This church activity was more important to her than a trip to Hollywood. Bishop James Crankshaft, a professor at one of the theological seminaries, said one of his students asked him one day, he said, what is the first thing we should do when we start our job as a, a new minister in a new church? What's the first thing we should do? Well, Bishop Crankshaft immediately replied, and he says, 
once you arrive at your new church building, he said, you go in, you go to your office, you sit down in the chair, and you sit right there in that chair until you realize that your church is doing the most important mission in the community. And then he said, give thanks to Christ that he has called you to be a part of it. The most important mission in the community. How important is the church to you? How important is your church to you? Do you believe that God has a plan for the church? Do you believe that what we are doing, preparing this world for the coming of the kingdom of God by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important work any group of people can ever do? Do you believe that? Or do you look at the church as just another organization that you belong to, something you think might be good for the children or perhaps good for business? I believe that God has called this group of people to turn the world upside down. I read recently about a country circuit rider in the old frontier days of the land. He was a humdinger of a preacher by the name of Jesse Lee. And he once preached a sermon on Acts 17, 6 that reads like this in the New King James Version. Those that turn the world upside down have come here also. Now the thrust of his sermon was that sin has turned the world upside down and the design of the gospel and the business of the ministry is to set the world back right side up. Well, the people of the town decided to have a little bit of fun with their uh, circuit riding preacher. And so everything in that town that they could turn upside down, they did. And the next time he came riding in on his horse and looked around, Wagons were upside down, signs were upside down. Everything in the town that they could turn upside down, they had turned upside down. The people of the town got a laugh at the expense of the preacher. But you know, at least they got the point of his sermon. They got the point of his sermon. The purpose of the church is to turn the world upside down, or better yet, right side up. You and I have a tendency to take the church of Jesus Christ for granted. We see some of us think of the church as only a mere instrument, as a club or a place where we can make friends or business contacts. What we fail to see is that the church is God's agent, Christ's body at work in the world. Christ came into the world to save the world. You know, we always hear John 3.16 quoted. Everyone can quote John 3.16. But we really need to read John 3.17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But how does Christ save the world? Certainly he saved the world through the cross. He gave his life that we might have life eternal. And that's 
true. We all believe that. What we fail to recognize, however, is that Christ is still saving the world today by giving of his body, the church, in service to the world. This is to say that you and I are central to the plan of God. But if we fail to do what Christ has called us to do, if we fail to be what Christ has called us to be, then Christ's saving action will be incomplete. The work of the church is a very important work. Indeed, it is a critical work. If you do not understand that, you cannot appreciate the work of the Apostle Paul and the words that he wrote to the church at Ephesus. Paul was in prison when he writes these words. He knows his time is limited, his days are numbered, and so he writes to the church of Ephesus with a real sense of urgency about the meaning of the gospel, about their mission as a people who are to convey this gospel. He conveys to them two important truths about the church. For God's plan to be realized, says the Apostle Paul, two things are critical. First of all, we it is vital that our unity be maintained. Paul writes, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as we are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In other words, it is very vital that the church be unified. I suppose there's, there's nothing sadder than to see a church that is split in dissension. A pastor once turned in his resignation to the church and uh, the reason that he did so he said that he had hired a young minister to take care of the youth in the church and you know when you're young and you're searching you can say some things that make older people uncomfortable and most of us that are older understand that but some don't. But there were some people in the church who had a big issue with it, and the church become divided. The minister thought that, as a matter of integrity, that he had to back his young assistant. And that's when the trouble really began. One Sunday he said, his wife went up to sit in the choir, as she always sang in the choir. And when she went up and sat down in the choir, two of the choir members got up and moved away from her so they didn't have to sit near her because of the split in the church. And he said that was the end for him. He turned in his resignation and left that church. Friends, if you believe that the church of Jesus Christ is the center of God's purpose for creation, if you believe that we are called to be the light unto the nations of the world, that very thing there will break your heart. If we are the hope that God has for this world, then the rest of the world is in trouble if we cannot love one another. Our unity is very critical. We must work as a unit. We must work as a team. 
I heard about a pastor that did a little experiment, experiment with his church and he put them in a big circle in a room. We can't do that here because we've got the pews in the way. But he told them, he said, now imagine God is right there in the center. Now he says, start moving in. Well, what happens when you move in? The closer you get, you get shoulder to shoulder and you can't get any closer. And he says, right there, I wanted you to understand you cannot get closer to God without getting closer to one another. Paul says that our unity is critical. He says one other thing. He said each of us has a gift to be used in God's service. Paul notes that gifts given to some of us to be apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. And the purpose of those specific gifts is to equip his people, the church, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be upbuilt. Those gifts which Paul lists are gifts of ministry. But then again, all of us have some gifts. Some are gifted as salespeople, some as engineers, some as mechanics, some as farmers, some as janitors, some as cooks. But all of us are gifted in some way or another. And it is when we offer our gifts to be used to God that God's kingdom is brought near. I don't think Ellie's old enough to have heard any of Aesop's fables, as she Carol, does she know Aesop's fables? Yeah. I didn't think, I don't even know if they teach those in school anymore. I'm old school. <laughs> I'm so old that they had a lot of those old things back then. But in the Aesop's fables, a fable about an old crow who was thirsty and he had been out in the wilderness and he had not had a drink for a long time and he came to this place and he found a jug and it had a little bit of water in the bottom of it and he stuck his beak in and his beak couldn't reach the water so what's he going to do well he was a smart old crow so he began picking up pebbles he dropped little pebbles in the jar, and what happens when the pebbles go to the bottom? The water comes up. And when enough pebbles got in there, the water was high enough that the crow was able to get a drink. My friends, that is my understanding of the way God has chosen to work in this world. Each of us dropping our little pebble, doing what we can for the church, some teaching Sunday school, some maybe making visits, some making phone calls, some serving as deacons or elders, cleaning, whatever you can do in the church, do it. Each of those pebbles that we're putting in there individually, accumulating in that bottom, the water is rising. And one of these days, God is going to bring us into his own kingdom. That is God's plan for creation. It is centered in this group of people. Now the obvious question for you this morning is are you dropping in your pebble? Are you using your gift to the glory of God? You may say, Pastor, what can I do? I don't have any gifts. Well, yes, you do have gifts. We all have gifts. And they're all different gifts. 
Let me tell you about a little old lady in a small church in Maryland some years ago, and her name was quite appropriately Miss Fuss. And she really could fuss, and she really liked to fuss with her young pastor. But he knew this, and he knew that she had a heart of pure gold. She was really a nice person underneath. She was severely handicapped with arthritis. Her fingers, her wrists, her elbows, her knees, her ankles were all swollen. She could barely walk, but she was at church every time the door was open. She had a cane that she walked with. When she tried to get up the steps, she had to have help getting up the steps. But she said to herself and she said to those around her, if I ever quit going to church, I will probably die. So she was there for every service. Well, Mrs. Fusses, Miss Fusses, young pastor stood up one morning and preached a sermon on the idea that each of us has a ministry. Each of us has a pebble that we can drop in the jug. After the service, Miss Fuss went up to him and said, Pastor, what can I do in the shape I'm in? And he looked at her, the old lady humped over, walking with the cane with all this arthritis and everything. He said, I, I, I can't think of anything right now, but he says, I'll pray about it and you pray about it, and I'll drop by your house later this week and we'll talk about it. Well, he prayed and prayed, and he couldn't think of anything. But he went to her house anyhow, and knocked on the door, she didn't come to the door, but she yelled and said, come in, because it's so hard for her to get up and down. And he went in and spoke. He was glad to see her, but she was even more glad to see him. She was just beaming. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm sorry, but I couldn't think of anything. And uh, she says, well, I have. And she says, just let me tell you about it. She says, we have lots of shut-ins in this church and in this little town that we live in. And some of them are not looked after every day and they have family, but they have family so far away that they could be dead for several days and nobody would know it. So she said, I decided to start a telephone ministry. And she says, I <coughs> am going to call each one of them every day <coughs> and talk to them and see their needs, their cares, their concerns. And she said she was only allotting five minutes for each phone call because she was afraid that if they talked longer than that, she would start telling them her problems. And she didn't want to. She was calling to see their problems and their needs. And this was no easy task. This was back in the days when they had the old rotary dials and her fingers would not work, so she got a stick, and she was very carefully. It took her a long time, but she called every day the people on her list to check up on them and take care of them. She found her niche, her way, that she could work for Christ. She found her way of dropping her pebble into the jug. And I say to you, if Miss Fuss, as crippled as she was, could have found her ministry, you and I have no excuse for not finding something. That is how the kingdom of God is coming together, one pebble at a time. What is the pebble that you have to offer? 
we see the crisis of the church today is not one of belief. The Gallup survey shows that most American Christians still pretty much believe the same things they believed several years ago, even though they don't go to church like they used to. I just saw a graph this morning on TV that uh, 20 years ago, and 73% of Christians in this country said they went to church. Today, that's down to 47%. Only 47% of the Christians attend church. That is very, very heartbreaking. But the crisis of the church today, and, it, and it's not... Belief. It's not resources. Most churches have far more resources today than Paul or Peter ever dreamed about in their lifetime. But the crisis of the church today is one of commitment. Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must take up his cross and follow me. And that is another way of saying that we must find that unique ministry that Christ has called us to be and to offer to the world. It will not be preaching for most of us. I, a few Sundays back, I asked if anybody wanted to fill the pulpit. I didn't have anyone volunteer. Or it won't be uh, teaching, we we got one teacher, and of course we're not using him right now because we don't have very many volunteers to do teachers. We're very thankful for Jackie that she played the piano this morning, and we're very thankful this church has three, but once in a while we're even, but all three are gone. But we're thankful when she's here. But there's all these things that we can do and it is our pebble to drop in the jar in our service to God and to his kingdom. There's a time-honored story that you will remember that maybe you remember that says that Gabriel approached Jesus in heaven after his time was finished on earth and Gabriel asked Christ, he said, Master, did you accomplish everything you set out to do while on earth? And Jesus replied, no, not yet. There's much more to be done. Gabriel was perplexed and he said, then what's next? What's next, Jesus? And Jesus said, I left it in the hands of my disciples. They will carry on the work that I began. Gabriel frowned and looked skeptical and said, Do you really think they will? What if somewhere along the way they forget or they stop? Do you have a plan B? Jesus answered, no, there's no plan B. That's it. I'm counting on them. No plan B. What a tremendous privilege it is to be the church of Jesus Christ. We are Christ's own body. We are the light of the world. That means that our unity is critical. It also means that every one of us has a calling. Every one of us has a ministry, a pebble to drop in the jug. <clears throat> and one day, one day, God will take all those pebbles and build his kingdom. The day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are you doing your part?
Are you, have you found your pebble and are you using it? Think about that this week. Let us pray. Father God, we, we thank thee for your son Jesus. We thank thee for the church that we established when he was here and the opportunity, the privilege that we have of serving in it. Help each of us, our Father, find our niche in life, find our, find our pebble to use in your service, in this your world, to draw others into the kingdom of Christ. Be with us, our Father. Help us to be stronger in the faith and help us to find that pebble and to use it in service to you. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.